me. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a good, uh, a great session uh, where we are going to learn. My name is uh, Dr. Lusquet Victor. I'll be the moderator for the day. So just uh, something brief about the format of today's session. We are going to have a talk uh, by Dr. Modekai Atinga. Then um, during the talk, I encourage as many of us to post uh, questions, okay, on the chat. Um, then uh, the, 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 the speaker will respond to the questions after the presentation. Then lastly, we'll have a brief uh, presentation from our sponsor, which is, a, which is Choker. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to welcome Dr. Modekai Atinga, who is going to do a presentation on uh, condom Malaysia of the patella. Karibu, Dr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really sorry uh, for my tardiness, but I was having some um, tech problems here, but I think we're now up and running. Um, can you guys see my screen? Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's get going. So I wanted to just talk about uh, patella chondromalacia or patellofemoral pain, which is something uh, we see very frequently in most orthopedic clinics. Um, I think management is fairly um, straightforward, but uh, once in a while, it's not the usual standard uh, presentation. And uh, it's always nice to have um, options and being able to think outside the box. Um, I'm currently working at uh, Aga Khan Hospital. My background is um, fellowship trained in um, shoulder and uh, knee surgery. Um, so in terms of patella chondromalacia, it's a bit of a catch-all term, like I said. It, it's, it's used to um, uh, mainly refer to patellofemoral pain. Um, in the you know, classic texts, um, it was described as inflammation and uh, softening of the cartilage, uh, which uh, led on to pain. Um, I, I mean, the association with patellofemoral chondromalacia that we think about is uh, this damaged cartilage. Um, you're looking for abnormal alignment, and normally it's a combination um, of those two with most likely abnormal alignment leading to the damaged cartilage. Um, now, uh, when you're looking at etiology, I guess um, the two things you want to know um, are whether the patient has, like I've mentioned, normal alignment or not. Uh, in someone with normal alignment who comes in with anterior knee pain, like the question you're wondering is whether there's been a traumatic event that has led to the cartilage damage, and that is now what is feeding the ongoing problem. Um, it, it's also been mentioned that uh, in pa patients who come in to see with normal alignment, it's worth looking for uh, bipartite uh, patella, especially um, if there's any instability in uh, the unfused segments, uh, which typically uh, then lead on to uh, increased um, lateral pressure. Um, abnormal alignment is where it, uh, it gets interesting. And uh, again, uh, most often uh, these patients will present with increased uh, uh, loading laterally, but the presentation is never that clear. You know, they have pain that can be medial, it can be on the joint line, and it can mimic uh, uh, a host of other pathology inside the knee. Um, in terms of things you'll be looking out for, you want to assess their Q angle, you want to find out if they're weakness or uh, BMO, and you're also looking at uh, rotation. Um, there's from the Proximal going down, you're looking for uh, antiversion, um, you're looking for valgus, you'll be looking for tibial rotation, and uh, whether um, they've got uh, plainest foot, um, which uh, in itself can mechanically lead to external tibial rotation uh, and abnormal loading. Um, so on the examination, you want to see, find those patients who've got, you know, the, the classic text again, uh, Miserable, miserable alignment. And these are the rotational uh, deformities. 
uh, that I've mentioned. Um, sometimes these can be subtle and uh, dynamic. So, you know, if someone is standing still, you can't see anything obvious, but once they start walking, that's when, you know, muscle weakness uh, leads to, you know, um, very, sorry, a valgus thrust uh, of the knee, uh, which in itself creates torsional forces that will force the patella uh, laterally. And the obvious one that we always check for is the valgus knee, as I've already mentioned. Um, in assessing rotation, um, I think that we can be thankful for the pediatric texts. Uh, a lot of them, um, these, these very same examinations apply in the adults. Uh, on your left, um, this is how you would want to assess for um, external tibial uh, uh, torsion rotation. Uh, you have the patient lying um, uh, prone on the bed with the knee bent at 90 degrees. And then you're looking at the, the, the angle of the foot relative to the thigh. Um, and anything more than 30 degrees, um, I, I think would be abnormal. Um, obviously this is within a range uh, for the uh, assessment of um, uh, femoral antiversion. Uh, it's the uh, picture on the right where again, you have the patient lying uh, prone on the bed. Uh, the important thing is to have, your, uh, to have your hand feeling the greater trochanter and as you move, uh, and as you ex internally rotate the hip by externally rotating uh, the tibia, you're, you're feeling for the point at which um, the greater trochanter is most prominent. And the angle then is measured uh, from the end of the bed and you're looking uh, at uh, how internally rotated the hip uh, is relative um, to a uh, vertical line. Um, uh, Valgus of the knee uh, is normally clinically uh, obvious and um, you can see the way the patient stands. Um, in more subtle cases, you can perform um, these long leg films um, and you're looking um, on the, the picture on the right is strictly speaking, looking at uh, the mechanical axis, but uh, measuring the Q angle, you're looking at um, the line uh, from the uh, ASIS at the midpoint of the patella to the tibial tuberosity. And again, uh, there's, there's a range of normality, but uh, someone over 20 degrees, you're, you're, you're beginning uh, to be worried, especially if they present with um, uh, anterior knee pain. Um, the typical investigations, you start off with x-rays as always, and it's uh, important to get the skyline view because that's where you get the most in, uh, information when uh, considering uh, what to do next and indeed even the diagnosis. Uh, MRI scan is useful when uh, there's no obvious malalignment um, uh, or rotational deformity that you can pick up uh, and you're then looking for uh, damaged cartilage um, that could again be the scenario where someone has normal alignment but um, has had a traumatic event uh, which will be shown on the scan. Um, the CT scan is probably the most useful uh, in terms of assessing uh, rotational abnormalities. Um, to be honest, we don't frequently um, use it because uh, clinically you can pick up a lot um, of the obvious deformities, but in terms of surgical planning, uh, it's an extremely useful tool uh, that will help you, uh, one, work out uh, where the deformity is, uh, and particularly combined deformities where there's both uh, antiversion uh, at the hip and external tibial rotation. Uh, and just an example there, skyline view, obviously uh, it's that ten tangential X-ray shot with the knee flexed about 45 degree degrees, also called the merchant view. And this uh, particular image here shows uh, what a perfectly uh, aligned patella uh, to the uh, trochlea would look like. Um, the MRI scan, like I mentioned, uh, is very useful uh, when looking for uh, damaged cartilage. Um, so the, the picture on the right is fairly obvious because you can't, you won't miss those cysts in the uh, patella, which tells you um, that uh, there's been ongoing damage um, uh, in the patellofemoral joint. Um, the picture on the left is slightly more subtle, and this this is easily missed if you're not particularly paying attention to it. Um, if you look at the medial patella facet there, you can see the uh, articular cartilage is slightly uh, lighter, it's a lighter gray color, and um, that is a very typical picture for patella chondromalacia. 
Um, and th this picture here is just showing you uh, where the CT imaging uh, can come in handy. Um, so, you know, you, you can measure the antiversion relative um, to the uh, posterior uh, femoral condyles, which you can use as your zero point, uh, and then you scroll and see how much uh, antiversion is uh, the, there is present. And then equally, uh, again, using the uh, proximal tibia as your zero point, you can then measure how much uh, external uh, rotation um, of the tibia uh, the patient has. Uh, in terms of the early management, um, it's rest, activity modification. Um, there's some mounting evidence that uh, using orthotics, especially in patients with planus, uh, yields good results. Um, uh, physiotherapists are very good at using taping, um, uh, which, which is always a, is a useful intervention, although I, I normally think it's slightly short-lived just because of the forces that uh, are involved. But obviously, if it's part of a, a program where you're strengthening your VMO and the like, then taping is an extremely useful tool. And then uh, pharmaceutically using NSAIDs and steroid injections when patients are having a particularly uh, bad time. Um, normally that's where it ends and you will not see those patients again. And sorry, I should have added weight loss there because weight loss is extremely important in managing any patellofemoral joint problem. And um, that is one of the conversations you must always have with patients who come to you with anterior knee pain. Um, most of the time, uh, those measures uh, will deal with problems, even those that are more advanced with uh, more complex uh, rotational deformities. So you must uh, focus on conservative management. And if it fails once, you go back and do it again uh, before you start contemplating surgical options. Um, and the, the actual focus of my talk uh, was really to just give you guys um, some of the options and I'm not giving you answers, but it's just a framework that you can use to think about patients you see who come in with a uh, recalcitrant um, anterior knee pain. So before you consider um, surgery uh, for patella chondromalacia or patellofemoral pain, you must understand the mechanics uh, and the etiology of your particular patient. Um, you know, you want to look at uh, what the malalignment is, and this is where the skyline views come in handy. You know, does the patient have uh, lateral tilt? Is it uh, a lateral riding patella, or is it both a lateral riding uh, patella uh, with, uh, with tilt? And obviously, the other questions that you must consider as well is whether they have come in uh, on the back of a history of something like a patella dislocation, where they have abnormal alignment, and in the course of the dislocation, they have then damaged uh, cartilage, and that's why they're now having symptoms, whereas before they had pre-existing problems that uh, were not uh, particularly symptomatic. You also want to look at uh, rotational alignment, alignment, as I've said, and we looked at uh, the ways of measuring it uh, with the prone examinations, which yield the most uh, information. Uh, but uh, this is a useful picture uh, for you uh, to look at and to also think about the Q angle. There are times you can have patients who standing in front of you do not have um, uh, a valgus deformity, but they could have a, uh, an extremely uh, uh, large Q angle uh, with a combination of uh, antiversion, uh, which they correct uh, by internally rotating uh, the femur. So the patella is going to be uh, medially pointing. Uh, and obviously um, with the foot pointing forward, the tibial tubercle is more externally rotated. Uh, and so the Q angle is big. And if you imagine if that is combined with external uh, tibial torsion, you can have a fairly large Q angle with someone who has got a fairly normal stance. Uh, this can further be compounded by um, ligamentous laxity so that when they're walking, if you imagine this scenario, coupled with a, uh, a various, uh, sorry, a valgus thrust in their gait, um, they, they could have a uh, dynamic situation where the patella is uh, under, the patellofemoral joint is under uh, extreme load. Um, so going, going into the surgical uh, options, uh, the easiest one, I suppose, and probably most unpredictable uh, is in the patient with a normal alignment and normal patella height, but with uh, some uh, patellofemoral uh, 
chondral damage. Uh, chondroplasty is not a bad option. Um, it's basically going in, uh, shaving any loose cartilage, gentle stimulation uh, uh, of uh, subchondral tissue. Um, I don't use microfracture on the patella, but some people do. Um, the results um, uh, are varied uh, at best. Um, I remember one of my mentors um, used to tell uh, patients uh, that there was a 70% chance of 70% uh, improvement, which sounds, Im it sounds impressive, but when you do the maths, that's 50-50. Uh, then you can also have this situation where the patient has got uh, isolated patella tilt. Um, so if you look at the x-ray, there's no um, uh, lateral translation of the patella. Uh, and in a patient who presents uh, with anterior knee pain and has got this picture on the CT scan, no rotational uh, deformity and anterior knee pain. And let me say anterolateral knee pain um, there's a good argument for, for performing a lateral release uh, in this scenario, and the results tend to be quite rewarding. Uh, however, that's an extremely narrow uh, indication for using the lateral release, and most of the time it's not a, an operation that you'd perform in isolation, and if uh, you get the indication wrong, you can leave your patient worse off with uh, their ongoing anterior knee pain, but you've also thrown in some instability for good measure. So always uh, assess everything from the top to the bottom, uh, use your imaging, and then uh, arrive at the way forward. Um, in this scenario where they have patella, sh patella shift and tilt, um, obviously the lateral release uh, would not be a good option and would uh, likely lead to further instability. Um, normally this scenario here um, is accompanied by uh, uh, rotational, uh, a rotational deformity, uh, and the patients uh, frequently will also have a patella alter. As you well know, there are many ways of uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, patella alter. And more frequently, such a patient uh, must always uh, carefully uh, ask in the history if there's been any history of dislocation, uh, as that skyline view combined with the uh, alter uh, output instability as probably a bigger problem. Um, in isolation, patella alter, um, a couple of biomechanical studies, um, this one by uh, Bikes um, in 2009, um, a lab study showed that patella alter led to increased uh, patellofemoral loads. Um, now that, that would become significant in uh, an individual who comes to see you following uh, some kind of patellofemoral trauma, because once you've had uh, damaged your cartilage, uh, your ulcer now comes into play because of the increased loading. So um, you, you have more pain because this damaged cartilage is uh, uh, trying to heal in an unfavorable, unfavorable environment. Uh, for the combined deformities in those patients who have uh, both um, uh, patella translation, tilt, and um, ulcer, um, I think uh, if the symptoms warrant it, you can consider um, operations where you're uh, shifting the tibial uh, tubercle and also performing uh, a lateral release. Uh, but the lateral release uh, is uh, just an adjunct uh, to uh, the realignment uh, of the Q angle. Um, and there are numerous ways uh, of um, performing the TTTs, which is an extremely versatile operation um, in managing uh, patellofemoral uh, problems. Um, the axial rotational uh, deformities, uh, so this is an antiversion, uh, femoral antiversion uh, and uh, external tibial uh, torsion, uh, are fairly complex surgeries, but in the right uh, patient, uh, very rewarding in terms of um, uh, sorting out uh, the mechanical problems. It's uh, probably best done when these patients are young uh, because they have the best uh, healing potential and you know the areas in which you perform these osteotomies, um, particularly the, the distal tibia, um, um, you want to do it in someone who will heal and not leave you with a non-union. Um, 
the, uh, carrying on with osteotomies, um, obviously the distal femoral osteotomy is a, is a good uh, option in someone who's got uh, significant valgus that is uh, mainly femoral in origin. Um, these patients with uh, valgus will have a fairly large Q angle, but if you perform the osteotomy, uh, it restores uh, the Q angle and uh, once uh, the bone is healed, you hope uh, you have a happy patient. Uh, sorry, this picture is not very clear, but uh, it, it just shows uh, typical restoration of uh, um, uh, the mechanical uh, axis uh, and also uh, Q angle. Um, and as I've said, uh, with the excessive femoral antiversion, the osteotomies can be for, performed distally uh, or proximally. In young patients, the proximal osteotomies uh, tend to be more commonly used. Uh, but um, there are clever uh, intermedullary um, osteotomy devices that you can use that are uh, fairly elegant solutions to these problems. Uh, in young, young patients, the distal tibial osteotomy and fibular osteotomy, I should have added, uh, again, uh, heal very well and uh, allow uh, good restoration uh, of the rotational alignment. Uh, in summary, um, the uh, patella chondromalacia is an or patellofemoral pain is extremely common and most people have it. And I'm sure uh, if you took a stroke, all of the people uh, uh, in this forum, half of you have suffered anterior knee pain at some point. Um, and so the management uh, is conservative and conservative and conservative. Again, you want to focus on weight loss, uh, quadriceps strengthening, um, consider uh, foot uh, orthoses as well uh, for those who are flat-footed. And it's important to perform a proper assessment to understand uh, what the mechanical problem is. Uh, and for those who don't respond well to their conservative uh, measures, uh, you can then consider surgical options, but uh, uh, it's not for the faint-hearted and uh, I don't do many of these. Um, uh, and uh, thankfully, uh, simple measures work well here. Uh, I hope you guys have just um, managed to get um, some something to think about whenever you see these patients with anterior knee pain, much as it's always physio, but uh, a proper assessment is key and uh, that will help in uh, uh, further planning. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Atinga for that presentation. That was quite informative. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's given us a lot of insights on how to manage uh, such patients. Um, we have uh, quite a good number of participants uh, here today, close to 60. Uh, I believe we can raise a few comments, a few questions. Uh, for Dr. Tari to respond to before we proceed. Are there questions on the chat? Not yet. Uh, there's a question. Any comment on uh, stem cell therapy? That is from Dr. Museve. Any comment on stem cell therapy, Dr. Oh, sorry, I, I got stuck on mute there. Um, uh, stem cell therapy, um, it's a bit of a catch-all term um, sometimes, uh, but I think with, but with patella chondromalacia, uh, the, the first thing is assessing alignment. Uh, once uh, you establish the alignment is normal and you've got a suitable mechanical environment, um, you, you could consider um, some kind of uh, uh, biological re regeneration. I mean, at the moment, we don't have um, a, a lab in our region, as far as I'm aware, uh, where you can harvest um, um, some chondral cartilage and send it for growth and then come back and do replantation. Um, so it's academic um, 
uh, some of the papers um, that I've looked at, if it's specifically damaged the patella, I think the results um, uh, are, are varied. Um, uh, and again, uh, most of them are performed in combination with a realignment procedure. Um, so it's hard to tell whether it's worked because the mechanical environment has been sorted out uh, or if it's worked because they've managed to uh, replace um, the damaged uh, cartilage. But it's an evolving field. And at the moment, uh, to be honest, I I'm not sure. Uh, it's horribly expensive um, and still experimental. So. Um, I think it, if we are to do that, it has to be within uh, the confines of um, an experimental situation where we're trying to get more information as opposed to saying it's a, a full on treatment. I don't know if that covers the question. Um, thank you for that response. I think uh, Dr. Museve might. Uh, ask some more questions if he, he has. There's a question when doing a tibia tubercle transfer and a lateral release, do you also, I'm not sure what ref is, do you also ref the medial capsule? Uh, um, are you able to read that uh, question, uh, Dr. Tinga? Um, let me see. Okay. Um, yes, I can see the question. Um, um, in terms of reefing the medial capsule, um, no, no, um, I don't uh, tend to do that. Not, not, pu not for patella chondromalacia, because with patella chondromalacia, the problem is uh, abnormal patellofemoral loading. Uh, my thinking is, if you've sorted out the alignment uh, problem and there's no instability, uh, performing a tightening on the on the medial side runs the risk of um, uh, adversely loading the patellofemoral joint. If you're doing this for instability, if someone is having recurrent uh, lateral dislocation, then yes, um, uh, the medial uh, patellofemoral joint uh, is part of the procedure, and you you want to um, you, you want to reconstruct uh, you want to reconstruct that. But for patellofemoral pain, I think what you're attempting to do is to reduce abnormal loads. Um, in the, uh, on the patellofemoral joint. Okay, thank you. I've seen uh, a few consultants who also, did, who also deal with such patients, Dr. Mbugwa, Dr. Makoha, and a few others. If you have uh, comments or uh, questions, kindly. Okay. Any other questions? Before we invite Ed, 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 before we invite our sponsor, what was his name? Edward. Edward, prepare as we wind up with the questions. Don't want to lock participants out in the questions, but it seems that uh, we've exhausted the, the questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Tari, for that presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. Okay, there being no other question, I think I'll invite uh, Edward from uh, Troika to do a very brief, very brief, uh, is it a talk or a, or a presentation on uh, their on their products? Karibu, Edward. Uh, Asante sana, Daktari. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lucetti, and uh, also uh, Dr. Tinga for the presentation. My name is Edward. I'm from Troika Pharmaceutical, and I'll just try to be very brief. As Troika, we are into uh, pain management, and we have some few products. And just to highlight some few products, the first is Dynapa QPS. This is our diclofenac topical spray. QPS stands for quick penetrating solution. And the second brand is Zyka Extend. This is paracetamol extended release. 
which has 325 MG as immediate release and 675 MG as extended release. And lastly, we have Dynapa AQ, which is diclofenac injection, 75 MG in one ML. This being the only IV approved IV diclofenac. It can be given as IV, IM, and also intradeltoid as IM intradeltoid. So just to highlight about Zyke Extend, Zyke Extend is paracetamol extended release, uh, which is 325 mg immediate release and 675 uh, extended release. So most of the time paracetamol is uh, widely used as a, a painkiller and it's used accepted as a first line analgesics. And as being a drug of choice, paracetamol is known uh, that it is much safer as opposed to any other uh, molecule uh, like NSAIDs. So uh, paracetamol most of the time to give its therapeutic effect is that it has to, uh, the concentration of the plasma, it should be four microgram per ml. So that is the concentration, minimum effective concentration in the plasma that is required to give its therapeutic effect. So what happens generally in the current situation that we have 500 mg paracetamol and one gram paracetamol. So there is a lot of issues most when it comes to frequent of dosing. Why? Because once you take paracetamol within three to four hours, the MSC level paracetamol falls below four microgram per ml within three to four hours. So you have to keep on dosing. So as a company, what we have done is that uh, we have developed Zyke Extend to ensure that we reduce this kind of uh, frequent dosing, whereby for Zyke Extend, we have 325 mg and 675 in one tablet. So for the immediate release, yeah, for the immediate release, uh, uh, 325 mg, once you take the tablet, it is immediately released to the system. It ensures that the MSC level is above four within the shortest time, therefore ensuring that there is faster onset of action. Then 675 mg starts being released. It is timely released for 12 hours. So while using Zyka Extend, this is the only tablet which gives you 12 hour protection from pain, whereby once you take the tablet, the MSC level paracetamol goes above four and 675, which is extended release, is continuously released uh, for 12 hours. So it ensures that the MSC level of, the, of, of paracetamol is above four microgram per ml within uh, 12 hours. And therefore, for Zyka Extend, you only need one tablet for 12 hours, as opposed to when you're giving 500 mg or the normal one gram, where you have to take up to a maximum of eight tablets in 24 hours. So the advantage of Zyka Extend is that we are able to reduce the pill burden to the patient. Number two, we're ensuring that there is no chances of recurrence of pain, because once the patient takes one tablet in the morning, he only has to take while well in the evening. And lastly, Paracetamol is known to cause liver hypertoxicity when you are taking in high doses and for prolonged uh, duration of time. So for Zyke Extend, it, you're only taking two gram. For the other paracetamol, you have to take up to a maximum of four gram in 24 hours. So Zyke Extend, you're only taking two gram and therefore reducing the concentration of paracetamol in the blood plasma. Even if you're taking for longer duration, there are no much side effect as compared to any other paracetamol. So Zyke Extend is available. Uh, you can take one BD. In most of the cases, uh, you can also, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to avoid using oral NSAID in most of the patients because you find that some of the patients have other uh, maybe complications, GI irritations, that some have renal failures and the rest. So in those cases, when you're using Zyke Extend, it is much safer. And to avoid any kind, if you need a topical preparation, then we have Dynapa QPS. Dynapa QPS is a topical preparation which you can spray at the site of a pain. And if you need an oral, then we have Zyka. So in that case, you can combine Dynapa QPS uh, and Zyka Extend. Your patient is going to be relieved of pain and therefore you're going to avoid all the uh, NSAs and the side effect. And lastly, for Dynapa AQ, it is the only injection which is available as 75 mg in one ml. It is, can be used as IV because it has water as a base as opposed to propylene glycol. So Dynapa injection is the only uh, diclofenac injection which can be given as IV infusion. You can give IV bolus 
you can choose even intradeltoid because it's just one ml. So those are our product. And thank you so much uh, for your kind support in most of our product. Our product, Zyka Extend, Dynapa QPS, and Dynapa Q are well available in all the institutions within Nairobi uh, and other regions, Kisumu, Eldoret, Mombasa, and even up to Garissa. So I kindly request you to support Dynapa Q, Dynapa QPS, and Zyka Extend. Otherwise, thank you so much, KOA, for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Edward, for the presentation. Uh, There's an announcement. You are, you are encouraged to participate in the in the polls. Kindly do so. Do we have any questions for the two presenters, um, Edward, Dr. Modekai? Maybe if there's a question that was locked out, I can see Dr. Oburu asked a question, but um, I think uh, it's been answered on the chat section. What are the costs, uh, Edward? Yeah, uh, for Zyke Extend, it is very cost effective. For Zyke Extend, one tablet is around 25 shillings. So when you're taking uh, one BD, that is 50 shillings within a day. For Dynapa QPS, uh, the cost is to the patient. It all, now all depends, but our retail price, our recommended, uh, okay. our price, our price to the pharmacy and to the hospital is around six hundred and twenty shillings. Now, I honestly cannot tell between hospitals because they have their own backup margin, but the recommended retail price is eight hundred shillings uh, for Dynapa QPS, and for the Dynapa injection, one ampule is ninety shillings. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? You are free to ask before we call it a day. No questions. Irene, do you have any announcements? No announcements. Okay. There being uh, no questions and announcements, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, Dr. Modekai Atinga for the presentation. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation. You are very audible, your slides were perfect. Okay, we really enjoyed the presentation and we learned quite a lot. We also want to thank Edward uh, also for, for the sponsorship, okay? And Troika at large for the sponsorship and uh, the presentation. Thank you, participants. Have a good evening. <laughs>